Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. God has to teach us that it's not what he does for us that is the most important, it's who he is in our life. And he's never going to go away. And as long as we have him, we have more than enough. And we need to trust God that no matter what, whether it feels good or it doesn't, whether it takes longer than I want it to, whether I understand or I don't, God is only one thing, and that is God is good. He cannot be anything else. He loves you. He loves you unconditionally. He has nothing but a good plan for your life and my life. But we need to realize that he doesn't always give us what we want, but he always gives us what we need. And I know some of you right now, maybe if you were up here, you'd say, lady, I would like to slap you. There is no way that you are going to tell me that what is going on in my life right now could ever possibly be good for me. Well, it won't be good for you if you keep having a bad attitude and murmuring and complaining and blaming and making excuses. But if you say, okay, God, I don't know what's going on, but I want to learn. If I got myself in this mess, show me how I opened the door. If this is something you're doing in my life for some reason that I don't understand, then please, please, please help me not to run away from you. I mean, I've had to pray many times, God, if you have to, Tie me to the altar, but don't let me run away from you because I want to finish my course and I want to finish it with joy. Amen? So, if you go on and read this, which I didn't even know it was there at the time, it says so many beautiful things about how he, he didn't let their shoes get old and he didn't let their clothes wear out. And, you know, I had a lot of years like that where I didn't get anything new, but what I had kept lasting and you know, we don't like those times, but the truth is, is that when I look back now and I see those years when we had such financial need, God took care of us. We never had to pay a bill late. I always found what I needed for my kids, even though I had to go to garage sales to do it most of the time. I lived in a lot of fear because I didn't know how to trust God. But God had, now listen to me, God had to let me go through that in order to teach me how to trust him for finances because if I would not have gone through those six years, I remember specifically, I would go crazy trying to believe God for what we need today to run this ministry for one day. What you don't understand now, you will understand later. We live life forward we understand it backward. And I look back now and I thank God for those things that I hated back then. And someday you may thank God too for some of the things that you despise right now. You may look back and say, oh my gosh, boy, was I full of myself. I thought I knew more than I did. I thought I was ready for more than I was ready for. Let me tell you something, God's timing is perfect in our lives. And then he goes on to say in Deuteronomy 8, I led you all this way to bring you into a good land that flows with milk and honey, where you'll have no shortage, plenty to eat, plenty of everything you need, and then I love this part. And when you come into that good land, and you have, all, you have houses, and you have this, and you have that, you have, in other words, when you come to the time in your life where you have everything you want, beware that you do not forget me. Now that's the message. When you come into that time in your life, when you have everything you want, you know, it's easy to seek God when you're desperate. And sometimes that's why we stay desperate. <laughs> because we don't seek God as much on the rainbow days as we do when we're hurting. And we must learn how to love God just as much either way and to trust him. There's two tests that you'll pass concerning money. How you act when you don't have any and how you act when you got a lot. <laughs> Having things can ruin you. They can destroy you if you don't have a deep 
relationship with God. Being well-known can cause you to mistreat people faster than anything else if you don't really have a reverential fear of God. We have so many of these places that we go to, arenas and things like that. I mean, somebody told me another story yesterday. We are told over and over and over. Here, here's one of the last things I heard. The lady said, we have all kinds of rock stars in here and all kinds of famous people. And you know what? Most of them are really unhappy. You guys are really happy. Well, see, that's a witness to people, just when you're really consistently happy. And we've had so many people say, your people treat everybody so nice. You value everybody. You wouldn't believe how some people come in here and treat us and how they act and the messes they make and how they tear things up. God wants us to behave well when we've got what we want and not get what you want and then do the very thing that he would not want you to do. Amen? The Bible says that when we endure temptation, in James 1.12, when you endure temptation, you will receive the victor's crown of life. Now, what is that victor's crown of life? If you study that out in some of the original languages, it means a badge of royalty. And it was something that runners got if they won the race, it was something that uh, any kind of person in sports, if they won the event, they would get this badge of royalty. And that badge actually was a badge, I would imagine, that, and it gave them access into special places where they normally couldn't get into. In other words, it gave them favor. And I tell you, there's nothing more wonderful than seeing the favor of God on your life and watching him do something for you that you know 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 was God, and that nobody but God could have put you in that place. You didn't have to struggle to get it. You didn't have to lie to get it. You didn't have to play games to get it. You didn't have to be a people pleaser to get it. God opened that door for you because you were faithful to him. And when we endure the things that we go through, and even though it's gut-wrenchingly hard, we do what God is asking us to do in the midst of the trial, then God gives us that badge of royalty. And boy, that's when life gets sweet. Don't you love to watch God do things for you that nobody else could do? I probably get a bigger kick out of that than anything else. What kind of test can you expect to encounter in your life? Let's just get really, really, really practical. Types of tests that we may encounter when we're on our way to promotion. Everybody say, I'm on my way to promotion. <laughs> Let's say that again. I'm on my way to promotion. <laughs> See, that's the thing to remember when you're going through a difficult time. I'm on my way to promotion. Okay, the first test that we all have to pass is the trust test. Trust in God when you don't understand what in the world is going on. Instead of saying, I don't understand. Why, God, why? When, God, when? Open your mouth and say, God, I trust you. <laughs> it hurts so bad I can hardly stand it, but I choose to trust you. I'm not going to try to figure this out. I was addicted to reasoning, and I remember God just telling me I had to give that up. You have to stop trying to figure stuff out. Because the more you try to figure out, the more confused you get. If I would have walked in here tonight and said, how many of you are going through a time of confusion in your life right now? I can guarantee you it would have been shocking how many people would have put their hands up. But you know, the truth is, is you cannot get confused if you don't get into reasoning. You just can't. Don't let your mind rotate around and around and around and around. What's going on? I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand. I don't understand. Why God? Why? When God? I don't understand. Why don't we just use that same energy saying, God, I don't know what's going on, but you do. And I trust you. You've said that you love me and that you've got a good plan for me. And whatever I need to learn here, show it to me quick so I can get on with your plan. Amen? We can learn how to fast track through the wilderness if we'll learn how to just simply yield to God and resist the devil instead of resisting God and yielding to the devil. Amen? Trusting God when heaven is silent. How do you like that when you can't get God to say one stinking thing to you? 
How many of you feel like it's been a long time since you've had a really special word from God? Okay, all right, look at me. Same thing has happened to me. I haven't heard anything specific for a long time. You say, you haven't? <laughs> well, what's up with that? <laughs> you know what God expects us to do? Walk in what we already know. And you know what I found out? When God wants to say something, he has no trouble doing it. Believe me, when God wants to be heard, he makes himself very clear. So sometimes we might be just as well off that he's not saying too much because maybe that means everything's okay. It's good for you to know that kind of stuff. A lot of the stuff that I know now are things that God has said to me in the past. And, you know, I'm not saying that I don't, I mean, I believe that we walk in the wisdom of God, and I believe that we're led by the Holy Spirit on a day-to-day -day basis, but I haven't had some great, big, divine, super exciting word from God in a while. And I would venture to say that there would be a lot of other people in here, I mean spiritually mature people, that probably would say the exact same thing. Just keep doing the last thing God told you to. When he wants to tell you something else, he will. And it may involve some kind of sacrifice, so you might be just as happy that he's quiet right now. <laughs> what about the security test? Oh, my gosh. Philippians 3.3 says, put no confidence in the flesh. On outward appearances and physical advantages and who you know and how many degrees you've got behind your name and what neighborhood you live in and what labels in your clothes and you know, whether you're married or not, or single or not, our security can't be in all those things. If it is, we're going to drive ourselves nuts. We have options. I, I'm happy about options. One of the girls that works for me, when she first came to work for me, I said, would you like this? And she said, what are my options? And I thought, <laughs> what do you mean? What are your options? What's wrong with this? <laughs> But it was something that I learned from because we do have options. And how can you even make a decent choice if you don't know what your options are? And so you have options. I have options. I can be insecure. I can need all kinds of compliments from people just to keep me propped up every day. I can need a fresh fix of strokes and compliments every day just to get through the day. If I cook a dinner, and which, well, that's not a good example because I don't cook. <laughs> I, better, I better say something different. Let's see. If, um, if I put on an outfit and I just think it looks great and nobody gives me a compliment, I can still be secure. And if I like it, I can wear it because I like it. Everybody else doesn't have to like it. If I like it, that's enough. You know how wonderful it is when we no longer have to fall apart because everybody's not falling all over us with compliments? Oh, my gosh. I remember when I started doing these meetings, and trust me, they were nowhere near this size. I mean, I've gone out and done public meetings. One time I had nine people, and I brought five of them with me. <laughs> I can tell you, this, this is exciting. This, this is a rainbow night. <laughs> <laughs> but I've had lots of, of other nights, and I was not a happy camper back then when that happened. My moods were controlled by what I saw in front of me, and I would feel very insecure. And I can remember being in meetings, you know, maybe I'd go to a church somewhere, and, and uh, you know, it's tough when you're up here and people are sleeping. <laughs> it's tough when they're, you're thinking, oh my gosh, I better get done, I better get done. They want to get out of here, they want to get out of here. It's really tough when you're a woman and you, you show up and nobody in the church knew that a woman was coming and a bunch of the men get up and walk out. Now, I've had that happen. That wasn't very pleasant either. You know what God finally taught me? Anybody who has any kind of a pulpit ministry, listen to this. God said, when you're in that pulpit, you better maintain your confidence because the minute you give your confidence away, you give the whole meeting to the devil. Amen? Amen? So I don't judge whether I'm preaching good or not on how you act. At least I try not to. If enough of you act bad, I might still have a problem. But, you know, I don't just look at the one or two that maybe don't seem to be getting it. 
For all I know, they didn't get any sleep last night. You know, there's a lot of reasons why things like that happen. But if you're insecure, you always take it upon yourself. Then there's the rejection test. Wow. I don't think there's anything that's much more painful than being rejected by people that you want to be accepted by. We all want to be made to feel valuable. And there are people here in this room that are still suffering because your parents didn't know how to love you properly. And it wasn't about you. They had a problem. They didn't know how to give you what you needed. Maybe you grew up in a situation where your peers didn't accept you or you were made fun of or, you know, maybe you had a learning disability or some other kind of a something or other about you that made people make fun of you and, and laugh at you and you've been hurt a lot in life and you've been rejected. But let me tell you something, God never rejects you. You're never rejected by him. And I love what the Bible says about Jesus. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. In other words, Jesus went through what he needed to go through in order to obey God, and he got his badge of royalty. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And he has access to special places. Yeah. Amen. Boy, that rejection test, man. I believe that many times the devil launches an attack of rejection, a painful attack of rejection that wounds you emotionally just before you're about to be promoted. I'll give you an example. When I was filled with the Holy Spirit back in the 70s and God called me to teach <clears throat> and I was teaching a home Bible study, <clears throat> I got asked to leave my church and lost all my friends. I didn't understand it. I didn't know what in the world was happening to me. But Satan saw, he sees sometimes more than we see and he launched an attack and God could have done something about it but he chose to just wait Come on. God can do anything he wants to. He could have gotten Job out of the situation that he was in a long time before he did, but he waited because there was something that he was doing in Job that was going to prepare him for promotion. Job lost a lot, but when he got through his test, God gave him back twice as much as he had lost. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. My gosh, I still remember the pain of being called in by those elders and being told that we were too radical and too wild. And, you know, we believe things that were not the church doctrine. And that we either had to be quiet or leave. Well, being quiet wasn't an option for me, and so <laughs> we left. And when we left, we lost all of our friends. And, you know, it was, I mean, it was just a very extremely, extremely painful thing. And then I worked at a church in St. Louis for a long time, and when God was ready to promote me, it was a good job I had, but he was telling me not to take the ministry and go north, south, east, and west. God was wanting me to get prepared to do what I'm doing today. And an attack of rejection by a group of ladies that I worked with was launched on me by the enemy and I'm telling you what, for three years, I shook my head and didn't understand what in the world was going on. They told lies about me. I mean, it was just some absolutely horrible stuff. But I look back now and I realize that God did me a favor because I had too much trust in them. And where I was going, come on, where I was going, God didn't want me to take them. You understand me? Listen, at every stop, somebody gets off the bus. Did you hear me? And sometimes when you're traveling somewhere, there's a stop in your travel and you don't understand and it's just a stop because God's getting somebody off the bus because they don't need to go to the next place where you're going. It's not somebody that would be beneficial to you. That's one of the tests that we have to pass is in letting God remove the people from our life that are poisoning us and trust him that he knows what he's doing. What about the Judas kiss test? Mm. Can you imagine Judas, one of the 12, betrayed Jesus with a kiss? How totally disrespectful was that? Went in the garden and kissed him. The one whom I kiss, that's the one that you're to capture. 
We've all had betrayal. Somebody that you trust tells your secrets. Somebody that you trust turns against you and gossips about you and tells lies about you. And I'm not trying to paint a sour, sad picture. I'm just trying to tell you that these are some of the things that you'll go through. Now, in between, you're going to have a lot of rainbow days. I'm telling you, hanging out with God is awesome. I mean, it is amazing, it is wonderful, but I would be lying to you if I told you that that's all it is and that you're not going to have some difficulties along the way and we need to learn to be the same on the high times as we are in the low times. That has to be our goal, to be stable in the storm. Is this helping anybody tonight? See, more than anything, I want to see people pass these tests and fast track through the wilderness and get on with what God has given them to do. There is one thing that I do like to tell you about God, though. If you don't pass your test, you will get to take it over and over and over again <laughs> until you do. So you might want to just go ahead and settle down and do it God's way. What about the forgiveness test? Mm. <laughs> Did you hear that? How many of you heard that low groan that went through? <laughs> you know what, honestly and truly, this is probably one of the biggest things that we face in life is being able to forgive people when they hurt us. And I love, 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 love what Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You know, actually the real truth of the matter is when people hurt us, most of the time, they're acting out of their own pain and their own dysfunction. And they really didn't just like target us to make us miserable. It's just that we got in their way on a day that wasn't a rainbow day for them. <laughs> and it didn't turn out so good. Sometimes people don't even know that they've hurt us. My father who sexually abused me for probably close to 15 years, over and over and over. When he was a man in his 80s and he finally got around to apologizing, talk about timing. It's like, why couldn't we have done this a little bit earlier, God? He actually looked at me and said to me, and I believe him, he said, I had no idea that what I was doing to you would hurt you so bad. Let me tell you something. There's, now, he knew it was wrong. But the way he had been raised and a lot of the incest that he had seen in his own bloodline had warped his thinking and he knew it was wrong, but he wasn't really just purposely trying to hurt me. And I know that sounds crazy, but people hurt us out of their own weirdness and dysfunction and their own pain in their life. And no wonder Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I know this is going to sound hard, but I actually believe that God wants us to grow spiritually to the point where we are more concerned about what people are doing to themselves when they hurt us than what they're actually doing to us. Amen? Now, I know that's a little bit deep, and it takes us a while to get there, but that's exactly what Jesus was saying. They don't understand what they're doing. They don't know that they're crucifying the Savior of the world. They have no idea who I am. They have no idea what they're doing. Even the devil didn't know what he was doing. If he would have understood what Jesus was doing on that cross, trust me, whoo-hoo, because now it's too late. <laughs> the blood's been shed, the price has been paid, and we are forever free. Amen. And look at me and let me tell you something. When you make it through the things that you're going through and God has promoted you and he's using you, it's going to be too late for the devil to do anything about it because once you graduate and get your degree and get your badge of royalty, nobody can ever take it away from you again. Come on, give God praise tonight. Amen. You know, we have a lot of different temptations in life, and one of them is the temptation to not trust God during times of trouble. But we only have two options. We can either trust God, 
or we can worry and fret and have anxiety and stress and fear. I think the choice is really clear. Trust God. I want to teach you more about how to handle the various temptations that come to us in life. You know, there are many different types of them. And it's important to recognize them and to know when and how to resist them. Gevangenen zitten wereldwijd vast. It's a hostile territory here. Prison. And I'm speaking proof of that. Zij die achter zulke muren leven zijn mensen. En Jezus vraagt ons om naar hen om te kijken. I'm here for third degree burglary. I have a lengthy sentence of 400 months. The judge looked at me and said, I'm going to sentence you to spend the rest of your natural life plus 20 years behind these prison walls. A lot of people don't have family here. So they feel forgotten. There's not a lot of people beating the door down to get in here to see us. That outreach of the hand to touch their lives in a personal way, to, to come visit them, to, to see that somebody is really thinking about them, that somebody cares for them on the outside. You're giving to people that really are like at the bottom of the totem pole. And with your giving, that, uh, that's actually bringing somebody up. It's the fact that you thought about us, even if it was just to come by and have prayer. We just feel loved, you know, that we're not pieces of garbage, you know, um, thrown away, um, that somebody does value us still, and that there is hope, there's hope for us. Tot nu toe hebben we meer dan 3600 gevangenissen bezocht zijn er meer dan 3 miljoen cadeautasjes uitgedeeld. En meer dan 139.000 gevangenen hebben voor een leven met Jezus gekozen. 